Good afternoon, uh, one and all, and welcome to today's webinar on uh, green neighborhood in high density, high rise cities. Uh, the webinar is also streaming live on our Facebook page, Admissions at Dubai Patel University Pune, and ArchiStudent.net. Participants can post their questions uh, and comments in the question answer box, and we will uh, bring them together in the question answer session. So hello, I architect Neha Sagam on uh, behalf of Dubai Patel University School of Architecture, Ambi. Welcome our guest speaker for today, architect Tony IT, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Uh, Saili Kankar, ma'am, uh, Principal, uh, 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 Principal of School of Pharmacy, Dr. Ashish Chimbarkar, sir, uh, Uma Zadov, ma'am, a Principal at uh, School of Architecture, uh, Head of Department, uh, Professor uh, Omkar Samudra, sir, Professor and Design Chair, Dr. Ravindra Deshmukh, sir, Program Head of Architecture, Professor Simanthini Nakhil, ma'am, and all the participants present here today. Uh, before we proceed further with the webinar, I would like to screen a small video by introducing you all to uh, Dubai Patel University. D.Y. Patil, we believe in your dreams. Dreams that don't fade. Dreams that don't let you sleep. Dreams that give you hope. We nurture this belief and instill our students to thrive on their dreams and turn them into reality. Located adjacent to Mumbai Pune Highway stands an institution that is revered for providing world-class education and an environment conducive to learning. D.Y. Patil University Pune is a vast campus that offers various academic programs and a wide array of amenities. Every step you take today decides the course of your future and we understand and value that. At DYPU Pune, we equip our students with the right industrial exposure that prepares them to excel in their careers and pursue their dreams. It's a place where we develop your creativity and nurture your mind so that you acquire advanced practical skills, grasp academic knowledge and get a wholesome learning experience every day. Students can choose from a diverse set of programs. The university offers postgraduate, graduate courses in engineering, management, pharmacy, hospitality, architecture and agriculture. All programs are approved by their recognized councils and UGC. We are proud to be associated with prestigious universities around the world which help our students gain global exposure. We offer a blend of traditional and contemporary teaching methodology which includes virtual sessions, case conclaves, workshops, seminars, advanced laboratories for practicals, industrial visits and a lot more. The D.Y. Patil University has stood out and made a name among the best private universities in India that provides the best possible learning environment for students and lays the foundation of their career. With a central library occupied with over 40,000 books and 12,000 e-books, to ensure the students and faculty can enjoy reading in our spacious reading hall. The library is fully automated with softwares like KOHA and OPAC online public access catalog to make the transaction hassle-free and handy for everyone which is also highly secure. With thousands of alumni working with reputed firms across the globe, 
We have a proud legacy of successful professionals, entrepreneurs, leaders, academicians, and experts. The faculty on campus is a team of talented, inspiring, and experienced trainers who guide our students and encourage them. They are highly motivated to developing skills, providing hands-on experience, and cultivating the passion of our students into a rewarding career. The campus offers modern infrastructure, comfortable hostels with spacious rooms, 24 by 7 restaurants offering healthy meals, and a world-class sports complex and academy offering students innovative programs such as sports medicine, sports psychology, sports exercise, and nutrition. These wide variety of co-curricular activities add on to the scholastic environment, making us a center of holistic growth and development. So, dream big, for you are the leaders of tomorrow, and we strive to make your dreams come true with us. So as we now commence with our webinar, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce you all to our guest speaker for today, architect Tony IP. Uh, architect Tony IP is the founder of uh, Tony IP Green Architects Limited at Hong Kong and is, and is a community-centric sustainable design architect and urban designer. Having worked as deputy director of sustainable design Ronaldo at Partners Hong Kong Limited, he is currently also the director at Hong Kong Green Building Council and Construction Industry Council Zero Carbon Park, chairman at Environmental Education and Community Action Projects, Vice Chairman at Materials Aspects Expert Panel, BM Society Limited. Chairman at Facilities Maintenance and Development Committee, YMCA of Hong Kong. And Chairman at the Hong Kong Architecture Center. He is an active member and serves at Antiques Advisory Board, Environmental Campaign Committee, Environment and Con Conservation Fund, and Support Group on Long-Term Decarbonization for Council for Sustainable Development of Hong Kong, SCR government. He is also working as the adjunct assistant professor at the Department of Architecture, Hong Kong University and guest lecturer at Capstone Design Project, Introduction to Architectural Design, Department of Civil Engineering, Hong Kong University and is a school manager at YMCA of Hong Kong Christian College. His passion and contributions to green architecture has been highly recognized by receiving 10 Outstanding Young Persons Award in 2016 EcoStar Award in 2014 and HKIA Young Architect Award in 2010. He has demonstrated a flair for multidisciplinary academic studies and over 15 year architecture, engineering and green professional practices in the building profession. His design and research were exhibited and presented in Venice, London, Copenhagen, Tokyo, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia and Hong Kong. I now request architect Tony, sir, to kindly proceed with the session. Okay. So uh, thank you so much um, for the introduction and thank you so much um, for uh, inviting me um, to have this uh, webinar. So um, let me share my screen. So everyone can see the screen? Yes, sir. Okay. So um, today the topic uh, I want to share is the green neighborhood in high density, high rise cities. So uh, um, this is the brief introduction of myself. And um, actually um, I, I don't repeat, um, uh, apart from the architectural practice, I also serve um, several uh, NGOs and the green building professionals organizations. So uh, maybe I can briefly introduce my, uh, my own practice. Uh, actually, I, I, I received the uh, Bachelor of Engineering degree um, uh, and then I practiced as a graduate engineer for three years and then I go back to school uh, to study architecture and urban design. Afterwards, I uh, practiced in the architectural uh, practice for uh, 12 years and just three years ago, I uh, start my, established my own firm, Tony Yip Green Architects. And this is the, uh, the key visions of my firm. Uh, we really want to have the design to uh, strive for the uh, global warming and the environmental and, and the social sustainability. So uh, what we are looking for is the integrative green. 
and uh, the green professional should not be a separate profession. It should be integrated in the uh, all disciplines, and it should start from the very beginning, and then to develop the design, and then uh, in the construction. So in my firm, uh, we have the multidisciplinary um, professionals, and also we strive for the green design. My firm's in Hong Kong, so um, if you have the chance to visit Hong Kong, please feel free to visit us. So uh, let's go uh, to the uh, webinar today. Uh, first of all, um, the topic, uh, the green neighborhood in high density, high rise city. I need to firstly introduce Hong Kong. So uh, this is the, um, the overall map of the Hong Kong. The total area of Hong Kong is around 1,100 uh, uh, square kilometers. Um, actually, Hong Kong is quite uh, famous for the high density development. And one of the reasons why is we just developed only 24% of the total areas for the uh, urban development. We preserve over uh, 16 to 70% of the area as the natural environment of which uh, we have total land area around 40% as the, as the uh, conservation natural uh, park. So uh, in order to preserve all the uh, natural and ecosystem, we try to squeeze all the development just within a quarter of the total land. And this is one of the reasons why we are living in such high density city. And this is the, uh, our living environment, uh, actually the current situation we live with. Um, urbanization creates uh, densely populated and closely packed living units in the high rise development with high plot ratio. And it is arguable that high-rise compact cities can optimize material and en energy consumption and be known as sustainable cities, but regardless of livability. So is it really a sustainable living environment we are looking for, or we should advocate for our coming generations, especially for our, for our children and old adults? They are spending most of their time in residence or they don't care because of their life right now, just in their mobile phone. So this is what uh, the hypothesis I'm looking for. Is it the higher we live from the ground level, the more disconnected we feel from the natural world and even from each other within a community. So um, actually for the high rise living, 14 years ago, a research on the residents' behavior in high-rise apartments in Manhattan, New York, already concluded that there was a high degree of enormity and social isolation. But uh, up to now, these phenomena are also not uncommon um, in the high-rise uh, res residents. And whether we uh, have the chance to in touch with the nature in the urban development. So uh, we need to have a change. And this is the um, philosophical framework um, i uh, looking for. Uh, actually, for the sustainable development, uh, what we are talking about is at the middle level, we are trying to do the 100% less bad, try to make the balance. But maybe all of you may understand that right now, um, the human activities after the industrialization actually affect the the whole world and the natural system actually also be affected by the human activities. So for the sustainable development, we are looking for not just 100% less bad, we should looking for upward. We should help to restore the natural system, the ecosystem. So what we are talking about is uh, whether we can looking for the regenerative uh, approach, co-evolution of the human and nature in the urban development. Um, so that drive me to research on the green neighborhood, what we call the green architecture for all in the uh, high-rise uh, urban cities, like uh, the case in Hong Kong. So I would like to share uh, with you four uh, different design approaches or consideration in the uh, green neighborhood in high-rise city. And the first one is the biodiverse architecture and living landscape what we call co-living. Uh, can you guess what they are doing? Um, actually, they are have the bird watching. 
um, the birds and some habitat are our neighbors and also part of the community in the city. So we can find them anywhere. And it's very important to uh, maintain the urban biodiversity. And there are four different kinds of the uh, biohabitats we have to preserve. Birds, uh, butterfly, bees, and also bats. And the main reason is they play a vital role in our environment, being responsible for the seed dispersal, uh, pollination, and pest control in forests. So um, like, like this the slide you are uh, watching is um, the guideline uh, published by the uh, Royal Institute of British Architects. Um, this talk about the designing for the biodiversity, uh, whether in our architecture we should accommodate uh, some uh, small pot for the biohabitats like birds and pets, whether they, it, it, this kinds of uh, space can integrate with our design. And on the other hand, uh, when we uh, design the landscape, uh, whether we also consider not just from the human perspective, but from the nature uh, points of view, like to carry out the butterfly friendly garden um, in terms of the design, the species, and also the uh, a shallow pool of water, some strategies we can take into account for the benefit of butterflies. And and this is another approach. Uh, right now in Hong Kong, uh, we are quite uh, popular for the green roof, but uh, that green roof mainly uh, serves for the humans as the visual pleasant. Uh, but we can also take into consideration of the biodiversity like this brown roofs. Uh, the roof can, sh can serve uh, for the temporary stay for the birds and other biohabitats. Like this is uh, one of the examples. This building uh, has the first front roof uh, built in London back in 2002. So you can see some small rocks, some plants there. They are serving for the birds uh, mainly and not just for the human leisure. And this is the, uh, one of the projects I did in Hong Kong, uh, the first zero carbon building uh, back to uh, in 2012, so already uh, seven years ago. And today I, I'm not focused on uh, describe the zero carbon building, but I want to uh, talk about the landscape here. Because uh, for this landscape area, we did the first urban native woodland to enhance the biodiversity. You can see uh, in the photo that this whole uh, zero carbon building and the park surrounded by the, uh, um, the high rise buildings. So we want to maintain the urban biodiversity. We allocate a parcel of the area around 3000 square meters of that um, we uh, plant uh, over 222 native trees and also uh, local species. That kinds of local species are, are very useful to attract the local uh, ecology like the birds and also has several environmentally benefit like because of the local species, uh, they use less water for irrigation. They don't need uh, some kinds of chemical for uh, pest controls and also don't need the fertilizer because of the local species. So that is uh, another new approach uh, when we do the landscaping, when we plant the trees here. And the second strategy uh, I want to introduce is ecologically responsible buildings. How can we care uh, the nature when we uh, have the uh, urbanization? So uh, this is one of the news uh, back to the 2004. Um, actually, the news uh, talk about uh, there are uh, 30 bird deadly bodies were founded uh, when this building just complete and, uh, and before the uh, opening ceremony. Uh, the main reason is that building uh, is located um, in the uh, in the urban district, and and I I, I don't know whether you uh, visit Hong Kong uh, or not. And in the old days, almost twenty years ago, we have our old airport in the city center, and just twenty years ago, uh, we moved that airport to the uh, suburban areas. So before we have the old airport in the city center. And, 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 and that limit uh, the building, 
the uh, timeline. So, um, so uh, uh, I so so that building just built after the airport uh, removal, and and then this is the one of the first uh, high rise office there with that curtain wall. So the curtain wall, the uh, the glass, actually like a mirror. The birds cannot uh, recognize whether this is the true sky or the mirror image of the sky, and then they strike to the uh, window to that. So uh, it's a very uh, sad issue, but it's interesting that you can see in this slide there's a drawing of a big bird, and this drawing actually uh, the property management want to uh, terrify the small birds. Oh, it is not the real sky, uh, you don't just uh, strike to it. And this piece of the drawing still keep here uh, all, uh, in 2020, almost uh, 15 uh, years. Actually, for the bird strike, it's not just happening in Hong Kong. Um, in terms of the, the world annually, uh, because of the urbanization and one of the issue of the bird strike to the windows, over a hundred million to billion uh, bird deaths uh, were found. So when we decide the high rise or the urban design, whether we should consider some uh, design guidelines to prevent this happen. And actually in the United States, they have the uh, bird friendly design guidelines. And there are couples of issues we should take care of, like this. The mirror is a very, uh, uh, reflect the image of the trees. So they define the 12 meter from the ground level. That is the dangerous zone. From that level, we should avoid to have such mirror to uh, reflect it, uh, to prevent the bird strike. Even for the glass, which is a very transparent, and that also uh, imposes dangers to the uh, birds. Like if you have the very transparent glass and just behind that have the big trees and the vegetations and the birds also cannot recognize whether there is a piece of the clear glass. So uh, we may consider when we have the building and when we have the building have such uh, much more glazing, we may impose some patterns like this or we can have some new technology. Um, this is a kind of uh, bird friendly uh, window design so you can see this piece of glass, what the human can see through the transparency, but what the bird can see the patterns. Why? Because the birds can see the outer violet. So the, uh, um, the manufacturer make use of the coating by using the ultra violet paint to, to coat, uh, to paint the patterns there. So it can give the signal to the birds that is not really the clear glass and not to strive for that. Another issue is the uh, ecological uh, pollution. So this slide showing the, um, the, uh, the, sculp the sculpture to uh, memorize the uh, 911 incident in New York. So every night uh, in New York, uh, uh, in the, um, the area of the 911, the towers there, they project to a strong night to memorize the, uh, the past uh, incidents there. You can see the small uh, white uh, pieces here. Those are birds. Because the birds are attracted by the strong light. So they fly around here and they lose their original orientation. And in the daytime, many dead, uh, bird deadly bodies uh, were found. So the mayor of the New York uh, and also the volunteer group, uh, the green groups there, uh, just don't want that to happen again. So each day they minimize the, the time for that lighting sculpture just within half an hour, even in some, uh, some seasons, they just, they just close off this. So when we carry out the lighting design, uh, we also can from the benefit of the nature, that perspective to, uh, to select the appropriate lighting, what we call good lights for good night. So, so for that kinds of the lighting, uh, that can, why the uh, good the um, uh, security and the functional requirements for people, but minimize the um, ecological pollution, and even uh, in in some countries they adopted light out programs, 
and you can you can understand that uh, for the birds, especially for the uh, migratory, they will fly uh, mainly in spring and autumn. So in that two seasons, for those cities joining the light up programs, they will switch off the external decorative lighting. Uh, uh, maybe before, uh, maybe after, uh, let's say, uh, 10 p.m. So that can allow the birds then fly through and not be uh, misorientated by the uh, strong external light. And the third uh, project I want to um, uh, introduce here is the human nature interactions. How can we in such high density environment have the chance to interact with the nature? Or how the nature in such urban environment try to uh, strive for their survival? So um, that comes up with uh, when we carry out the design, whether we also can learn from the nature, whether we can also give some provision for the nature to grow. Um, on the other hand, uh, for the urban dwellers, uh, especially like in Hong Kong, many people, they have uh, um, also very keen on to plant, to interact with the nature. So like this, uh, people cannot find a big planter pot. Uh, what they can do just to plant the small uh, vegetations on the plastic bottles. And also in the urban area, they want to try to decorate the urban area to be more uh, greenery. On the, and the, on the other hand, they are also very in favor, uh, in touch with the nature. And actually, uh, uh, many research uh, justified that uh, people have the infinity to the nature from, the, from our uh, inborn uh, characters, like a, uh, the, the design concept of the biophilia or biophilic design uh, because of our inborn infinity, so we uh, enjoy in touch with the nature. So how can we have more opportunities in the high density environment? And I did several uh, research projects here, and one of them is ask for uh, the urban dwellers, what are their interpretations of the nature? And that is a quite interesting. That is a part of the photo elicitation study. And because of the interpretation of the nature, which is a very personal, even every day we in touch with the nature, the daylight, the wind, and, and the greenery but whether we notice them or not. As a designer, we don't know. Designer, we design the space and the end user move in to enjoy. So um, that drives me to, uh, to research on what the urban dwellers from their personal level, how they understand the urban, native, uh, the urban nature interaction. So they took uh, the photos and then they, um, and then they, they, uh, they elaborate why they took that photo. So, um, and also I did several urban uh, small projects to justify whether we can have um, more chances to in touch with nature. And one of the projects is, this, this is a very small project. I, I create a mobile architecture. And this project, I collaborate with the Hong Kong Arts Center because they have a uh, art festival. And we try to make this uh, small uh, trolley, the court, and that actually can facilitate the uh, outdoor learning. So I make uh, use of the, um, the um, unused uh, children uh, desk, and we polish them and make this small furniture, and this court can be extended as the blackboard. And I did the seminar in the park and also the workshops for the families and the children. The justification, justification here is we bring out the art learning, not just within the classroom, but it can be anywhere, even it can happen in the communal green spaces. So that is uh, how to facilitate them, just a small piece of architecture and some kinds of the mobile furniture. And for this, um, Mobile art car, I also install the PV panels, uh, the solar panels on the top, and that can support the electronic devices for teaching or for uh, mobile charging. Another project to um, verify 
or to signify the human nature interaction is this, what I call the concrete jungle 2.0. And this is the, uh, the, uh, a piece of undesignated space under a flyover in the central district. So the adjacent road, uh, very heavy uh, traffic. And there is a government building just uh, uh, nearby. So this is undesignated space. No one used this area apart from people uh, do smoking there. And we did uh, some small interventions. We move in a small container and that becomes a education hub. So in, um, and it uh, is, uh, is all make use of the passive design. So no electricity is offered and make use of the natural ventilation and daylighting. And there are exhibits, uh, some kinds of the human nature interactions, the research findings here, and try to exhibit uh, to, po to advocate the chances of internet. And we organize the workshops for the students and for the neighbors just around that area during the weekend. And also, um, just uh, beyond that container, we set up the improvised urban farm. We make use of the unused wood pallets. And, and start that farm and also some hangers for the vegetation growing up. And this project lasts for four months and it is a very um, 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 surprising that uh, many neighbors, even for these, these people, uh, those are the working staff in the adjacent government building, during the lunchtime, they go there to plant their own vegetables. And this small intervention, because of that setup, becomes the social interaction space for them. Because they have their own plan here, every day during the, um, in the morning, even afterwards, they will visit their own plan to see uh, whether they grow healthily. So, um, and I also uh, collaborate with the organic farmer and taught them uh, some skills for the gardening. So um, those are the vegetables. We have uh, three, ha three batches of harvest just within the four months. What well, I really want to say that even for the undesignated space in the urban area, just small intervention with some at, uh, activities and can be a connection point for the society and even the in connection with the nature. And for this project, we really found that the urban dwellers, they are really uh, love to love to interact with the nature, especially for the gardening. Another project uh, for a school, uh, also we make use of the container as the education nursery. And this project, some interesting point I really want to share with all of you that, and this school is a special school because for those students, they have the disability of hearing. So uh, we engage the program to ask them to um, help to uh, decorate the interior space. These students, they are, have a very good art sense. They did very, very good artwork for that decoration. But one point uh, we, uh, we have learned in that project is, you know, these students, they are uh, concentrate on painting the wall, but because they have the disability of hearing, they don't know whether, when I will give them an other instruction. So you can see there's a skylight in that container and we make use of some paper butterflies here. The main function for that main, uh, paper butterflies is to uh, create some uh, shadow casting on the wall. So just in case we want to catch their attention, we swing those butterfly here and the shadow casting on the wall can give some signal to those students, oh, uh, the teacher, uh, want to have another instruction. So these, these strategies are what I learned is from this project. I understand uh, some um, uh, audience have the questions on uh, the previous slide. Maybe I can uh, uh, speak uh, through the whole uh, slide and then I will uh, go back to answer your question. So, so for this uh, interaction with the students, um, actually, it's not just the architecture we design and the process we learn, how can we uh, interact with the nature, not just the, um, the nursery uh, we provide and also how to um, make use of the daylight to help them. 
And other um, improvised small architecture uh, I did. This is the new children hospital in Hong Kong. And, and I am not the uh, architect for this student hospital, but I have the chance to do the, uh, the small greenhouse to collaborate with the NGO, uh, uh, make a wish, and this NGO to help to, uh, for the children, uh, they have illness. So uh, we make a small architecture, small mobile for the uh, planting, because for those uh, uh, children, uh, patients they may not can walk to the greenhouse so for that small card like the previous art card uh, I did so they can uh, the volunteers can do the workshops can and also can let them to have the chance to interact with the plant uh, even they are in the world so all these are some kinds of the um, mobile or improvised architecture and how to make use of the undesignated space for the uh, for the permanent architecture for the high rises, how can we advocate the um, urban native interaction? So here, the final uh, design consideration we can look at is the urban living with the sky gardens. So the sky gardens in the old days, uh, back to the sky gardens in Babylon period, um, the queen really uh, have the homesick of the uh, the park. So this is what the origin of the sky garden. And even in the old days in Hong Kong, because of the limited of land, uh, we make use of the roof as, as the playground or also as the school. And, and then um, this is a kind of the urban farming on the roof. Exists in Hong Kong, no matter in, uh, for the residential or in the commercial. And what I'm talking going to talk is the sky garden. It's not just the roof garden on the roof and not the podium garden or street garden. It's the intermediate, at the intermediate levels. That is the covered outdoor space. And this is the typical uh, high-rise residential blocks in Hong Kong. So whether we can have much more the uh, communal green spaces at different levels. Uh, actually, the government of Hong Kong, uh, back to 201, also has the incentive to incorporate more greenery in the high-rise residential developments. So this is uh, extracted from the guidelines. Um, for that, they advocate to have more greenery and also the sky garden, aiming at improving the urban ventilation greenery and recreation green spaces for neighbors. Almost the same time, uh, just uh, three years before the Hong Kong government introduced this the incentive, the Singapore government also introduced this similar uh, incentive to advocate the sky garden. But you can see uh, the diagram I extracted from two guidelines from two cities. The left-hand side is from the Hong Kong, the right-hand side from the Singapore. You can see the Singapore one, the sky garden actually uh, scattered and integrated um, at different levels and different spaces of the whole building. But in Hong Kong, quite discreet, just a single uh, floor. And in terms of the guidelines, the details, actually for the uh, Hong Kong one, is quite restricted. Restrict the overall building height and also the, uh, the, the space, whether it should be countable for the sellable area or not. And also have the overall the building height restriction. But for the Singapore incentive, they are quite relaxed. They can have much more uh, granted uh, gross floor area just in case those area can receive adequate sunlight. And also they allow the additional floor height for the overall building um, in terms of the different building uh, numbers of story. If the building have the uh, 50 stories, they can have 30 meter height relaxation to incorporate those communal green spaces at high level. And these policy differences uh, drive the output of the um, skyscrapers. So I did the research to analyze 20 cases in Hong Kong with that sky gardens and 20 cases in Singapore with sky gardens. You can see in these two diagrams for the Singapore one, those sky gardens scattered at different locations, even connect the building together. So this somehow, this is what uh, my findings here for those communal green spaces, 
they have different kinds of the benefits from individual, psychological and physiological, and the community in social aspects, the environmental and the ecological. But how can we have those communal green spaces at that high level can um, contribute those benefits? So we should take care of four points here. I will elaborate one by one. The first one is the light, air and view. And this uh, very um, uh, dictated on the location of the building. So three buildings here. One is the sky garden just adjoining or in front of the harbor front. Uh, so they have the one middle level of sky garden. And for another one in, uh, in, the, cent in the center of the urban uh, district, and they have the sec uh, separate sky garden to facilitate the neighborhood activities. And for another one in the old district, they have the sky garden connecting to sky cup house. So for the light, air and view in the urban design, especially for, for so many high rises, we have two issues here. One is the uh, urban heat island effect and the other is the wall effect of the buildings. And those will enhance the temperature of the inner part of the city and also have the issue of the urban ventilation. So when we consider that sky garden, not just for the communal space for people, but also can help to facilitate the urban wind to penetrate. So it all depends on how, how large the, the opening to increase the building permeability. So some uh, rules of thumb here, uh, the building, the opening should have at least three meters. And for those uh, sky gardens at the lower part, it should have the higher headroom because we have the many vehicles at the ground level and the ground activities. So for, the, for that part, we should have high headroom to ventilate the airflow. But for the upper part, if the sky garden located at the high levels, somehow it should be changed because for the strong wind. So this is the um, computer uh, fully dynamic model to illustrate that if the, the sky garden have the uh, different headroom, will contribute a different head, uh, the airflow. And this is a summary. For the macro level, we uh, want to facilitate the urban ventilation. So it should be effective at the lower zone. What, what is the lower zone? Uh, in Hong Kong, it's about uh, from the ground level to uh, 20 meter. That is the low zone. Because in the old days, all the old buildings uh, are that, at that tall. So we try to have the high headroom to to provide better ventilation at the street level. But for the, out, for the high and mid zone, we should consider the micro urban climate condition because we want to all offer the better outdoor thermal comfort. So for that level, we should have the wind breaking design, wind shielding, not allowed to so strong wind passing through. And a couple of cases I would like to share with you. And this is one of the projects I did uh, five years ago for the uh, urban renewal project, the new residential. Uh, we create the vertical slot because that building um, located along the wind corridors, according to the analysis from the wind rose design, wind rose diagram. So in the summertime, uh, the prevailing wind coming from the uh, southeast. So for that building, we create a vertical slot that the wind can pass in through, not just for the users within that property, but also for the neighboring buildings. In other buildings in the central district, this is a commercial building, uh, have the office and shopping mall. So for that, uh, what we call the urban windows have the large opening. The main function is like this. And this is the main building that that office development uh, commercial development. So that is the Hinesi Road, which is a very, very um, heavy traffic in terms of the vehicles and also pedestrian. You can imagine if we don't introduce that uh, big opening, all the wind coming from the left hand side will, from the right hand side will be blocked. And that's why we carry out the uh, CFD, the computational fluid dynamic, and find out that if we have that opening at the strategic level, it can help to ventilate the, um, the street environment. And, and the second thing is the greenery. Uh, the greenery at the uh, Sky Garden can help the, on the psychological and physiological uh, benefit. 
So here, um, um, there are two cases, two sky gardens here in Hong Kong, and one is um, in the upper part, the planters at the perimeters of the floor plate. So this is sky garden. Uh, we located all the greenery at the building edge. This is a case one in Hong Kong. And the case two in Singapore, this one we locate all the greenery at the central core and allow the panoramic view at the um, perimeter. So what do you think, which one is better for the residential high rises? Um, uh, because we are on the webinar, so we, we, we can't uh, know what your preferences, but um, from my understanding, and actually the top one is better for the residential high rises. The reason is, uh, we have the understanding what the function of the sky garden and who are the most frequent users in the residential development. There are two main types of people or main types of most frequent users. One is children and the other type is elderly people. So for the children and elderly people, if they stand just in front of the clear glass uh, at the bottom deck cases, they may feel they will have the sense of the safety and security, whether they will fall uh, apart from that. So somehow for the sky gardens here, we have the planter at the perimeter, the top cases, that can serve as the buffer zone visually and physically, and then to enhance the sense of security for those children and elderly. So we have to understand that who are the most frequent users for that communal green spaces, and and over the spatial design facilitate their activities. Of course, in the market-driven city like Hong Kong, the lower case is more sellable because it can see it's a wonderful uh, infinity swimming pool. But in the reality, we have to ask for who are the most frequent users in that property. So like this, this is uh, the project uh, I did. So we have the planters just at the parameters so in such case, even in that high level, you, you we may not feel uh, scared because at that such high level. Another very famous case here, this is the, uh, the vertical forest residential towers in Italy, Milan, and two residential uh, towers uh, uh, has uh, 26 stories and have over 900, trees uh, surrounded the step two residential towers. So that uh, trees can be a good for air filtration, shading, noise buffer, so and so. But for that cases, uh, in Hong Kong, um, it may not be applicable. I, 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 I may not, uh, I, I don't know whether it is applicable in your city or not, but in Hong Kong it's not applicable because in Hong Kong in summer, we have typhoons. So we can't afford to have the big trees in the top at, at high levels. In case of the typhoon, if the trees fell down, it's very difficult to, uh, for the maintenance. And that just uh, want to um, uh, let you understand that the species of the vegetation in the sky garden also very important. It should be wind tolerant and ability to grow under shade and use less uh, irrigation. Otherwise, for those planting, they may lack of maintenance, they will die. And that sky garden, that vegetation may not work. So, um, and, and also, they also serve other functions like the wind break, visual smell, edible and season, seasonal change. And the third consideration of that urban living with sky garden is the communal spaces, especially for those pocket space as the extension of the living room in the high rises. And Several key points here for the communal spaces. One thing is the accessibility. Here are three different types of typologies of the sky gardens in Hong Kong and also in Singapore. So for this one, the sky garden located in the mid level and the top level, as kind of the connecting all towers together. So it has more better accessibility for those sky garden. The lower one on the left hand side, the sky garden at a separate floor. So you can imagine whether the community really convenience for them to access that sky garden uh, day by day. 
But for the right hand side, this one, I uh, mostly prefer doorstep gardens. So for those communal green spaces, just adjacent to the front door of each apartment. So day by day, they can be there uh, as the um, neighborhood space. As I mentioned before, um, the children and elderly can sit there. In other examples, in Singapore, uh, the, all the greenery as the extension of the communal corridors, and that can facilitate the daily activities and also the casual interaction. Some several cases, case studies here, this is the Singapore cases, the Newton suits, suits here. Um, uh, every floor stories have the sky garden just adjoining to the leaf lobbies. So it can help to uh, casual interaction among the neighbors. Another case here in that residential high rises have over 12 different sky gardens scattered at different areas, provide different uh, spaces to the neighbors. And Apart from the accessibility, connectivity also play an important role. Um, like this, the Sky Garden as a circulation, as I mentioned before, or the Sky Garden as the uh, circulation, uh, connecting different floor, different towers, or the Sky Garden can connect to the clubhouse, the amenity facilities. Like this one, if you have the chance to visit Singapore, I strongly recommend you to visit this. This is a public housing. Um, uh, the name is Pinnacle and Dustin. And this is the first uh, public housing incorporate the uh, Sky Garden. There are two Sky Gardens here, one at the 26th floor. This one is exclusive for the uh, residents of that estate. And for the top one at the roof, at the 50th, 50th floor, that is public, public, uh, publicly access. So you can uh, visit the top floor the roof garden. Apart from that, connecting the several towers plots, and it also accommodate different amenities there. So every time I went to Singapore, I will go there and see what kinds of activities happen there. This is the at the mid level, and they accommodate the jogging track, the um, children play area, the sky dream, and also the resident committee center. So the uh, resident can enjoy the communal spaces at the high levels. And at the top one, the Sky Garden, also have the observation deck, um, not just for the local neighbors, but also for the visitors. Another, and, and that, the previous uh, essay, just back to almost 12 years ago, that is the first public housing with that concept. And this is the another new one, the Sky Terrace and the Dawson, incorporate the Sky Garden. So just last year, I visited there, so the architects here, the concept is for every, um, every uh, 12 stories and they accommodate over 19 units, like a small village, and they should have a piece of land as the Camino space. So every 12 story, they should have the Camino Sky Garden for their uh, community or neighborhood activities. So I visit there. And one thing I found is very justified. This is the local people. They have their lunch here. They have the BBQ parties there. They enjoy the Camino space. And even for the comfortable outdoor space, even in the rainy, uh, rainy days, especially in Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, especially in the summertime, we have heavy rain. So that kind of space can still be uh, uh, available for the residents, even on the windy days. And the last uh, consideration of uh, the, the Sky Garden is the amenities. So this is another project I did in Hong Kong for the uh, residential apartment. So the Sky Gardens, we have some um, uh, cycling equipment there, and the amenities can uh, facilitate the local residents, even active or passive. And this one, these sky gardens are in United States. And this is a very interesting sky gardens design. You can see this accommodated sitting area and the table tennis table and have the very large opening. So you may have a question, if that sky garden at high level for this very strong wind, how people can play table tennis there? I haven't shown the half of that photos to you because for that sky garden, on the one side, they have the very big opening, but on the other side, they have 
very small louvers to control the airflow. So the air penetrating in that sky garden is well controlled at a comfortable level. So it is not windy at that location. People can play table tennis there. Another, another um, uh, case I would like to introduce is the previous case, most of them are for the public housing, whether the sky garden or the green building can also facilitate the marketing, especially for the residential um, luxury apartment. So this is one of the most expensive uh, private residential developments in Singapore. So it is designed by the very famous uh, um, French uh, architects, uh, Jean Nouvel, and even that building also named as his name, Nouvel 18. And this building incorporates um, 10 different um, sky gardens, and each sky garden accommodates different theme and activities, like some sky garden, sky garden for fitness, some sky gardens for BBQ, some sky garden, sky garden for reading or family gathering. Uh, I'm not advocate uh, for such a luxury apartment uh, is really good for the urban development or sustainable development. What I really want to mention is that for that uh, communal green spaces, they can have uh, the economical um, uh, benefits, even in the private uh, driven projects. And other projects like this, uh, that communal green spaces as the connecting bridge of the two residential power, uh, towers. So that also come accommodating different amenities like the uh, swimming pool, the jogging park, so and so. But as a designer, we can design a very nice place. Uh, you can understand that for operation, that will be another story. So even for those sky garden nicely um, designed and the property management, they have the concern. So they may have the concern like this, uh, for those communal green spaces, because for the ease of the maintenance, they have the warnings, uh, notice that no smoking, no food, no drink, no dogs, no other pests. And that actually may somehow is uh, violating the original ideas of the Sky Garden to advocating the social interaction. And the last thing I really want to emphasize that when we design the uh, human nature interaction spaces, communal green spaces, we should pay more attention who are the most frequent users, especially for the residential areas, children and elderly. So this is one uh, of the uh, communal green spaces in Hong Kong. And less than, um, uh, you can see for that narrow spaces and these kinds of provision, you see really accommodating for the kids to play around or shall we just have that uh, kinds of the equipment? Is it enough? or we can and, and, uh, accommodate some kinds of the natural environment, uh, wideness, and give them somehow have the adventure to that space, or we can incorporate the garden-based activities, let them to uh, plant their own vegetables so they have the daily care on those space. They can have more interaction with the neighbors, especially for children and elderly, they have more time, they can take care of the vegetables. And even these uh, photos took, uh, took, uh, taken from the uh, existing building almost 30 years ago, and they, uh, the local residents, they changed the original planters for the, uh, planting the uh, edible vegetables. So it's a really uh, good case, as I mentioned before, even for undesignated space, we just have a small intervention. We can provide a space for community, neighborhood, and interaction with the nature. So, this is the uh, conclusion uh, of um, what I uh, deliver today. Uh, whether the higher the building, can we have the more the livable green spaces? And whether we consider the environmentally driven consideration, including light, air, and view, are part of the environmentally driven, social oriented consideration also pay attention, creating sense of neighborhood with good accessibility and connectivity. Meanwhile, uh, residents were willing to pay more for that communal green spaces. So either on their pragmatic needs or moral, or they have the inborn characters on the, uh, to the nature. And we should, if we uh, have the high rises, the green neighborhoods, the doorstep gardens are 
important, which can stimulate the in, uh, intimate touch with the greenery in daily life. And also the communities and green spaces to be livable and enjoyable by those daily frequent users. And that can help to establish their neighboring friends and their in touch with the nature. And this is the concluding remarks of uh, the nature today. There is no green city, but a city for green neighborhood and green living. Architecture is a physical thing. The most important is the architecture that facilitate the green living or the green neighborhood. So that's the end. And the, uh, thank you uh, for your attention here. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. I think that was an uh, illuminating session. So uh, I think we have a few questions in the uh, question answer box. So just taking a, uh, the first question, um, Sakshi Borse is asking, can you explain more on the bird friendly window design? Okay. So uh, for the bird friendly uh, window design, because in the high rises building, and um, we have the uh, too many glazing here, so the birds cannot recognize whether there is a, a reflective uh, image of the sky or the real sky. So we, um, we need to take care of them. There are two parts we have to take care of. We have to identify where is the uh, most dangerous zone. As I mentioned before, from the ground level, uh, 12 meters from the ground, because there are many trees on the ground level, so if the glass is so reflective, the, uh, it may confuse the birds. So for that glazing, we should make some patterns on those uh, the, the, the clear glass and give the signal for the birds. Oh, that is the, somehow that is a wall. Uh, it's not a reflective sky. Or as I mentioned before, it should not be so transparent and have the vegetation behind. And this is one thing. And the second thing is and when we consider to build the whole um, infrastructure, we should also have the uh, biodiversity infrastructure plan. You know, for the, like the city in Hong Kong, uh, most of the uh, ecological activities running from the uh, harbor front to the mountains. So there, somehow they have the ecological corridor. And, you, and when you design the whole cityscape, you may consider have several uh, green patch to connect that space. So that green patch, for example, is a park or the green roof of some existing buildings. So along that ecological corridor, we should avoid to have so many high rises with the um, uh, curtain wall, the glazing there. So that is another approach in the more uh, uh, macro concept. And the third point I want to emphasize that if you really go for the uh, sustainable building design, we, one important factor is climatic responsive. So whether we are really uh, look for more um, curtain wall building or have the building have high um, uh, glazing, full of the glazing, is it really benefit to the people inside? Is it really benefit for the energy efficiency? So somehow we may minimize the use of glass. Or for some orientation, you can introduce more diffuse daylight. You may have the bigger glass. But for another orientation, if they uh, receive more direct sunlight, we should minimize the glazing area. And so for that approach, at the same time, you can avoid the burst strike. Also, you can save energy. So somehow, uh, this is kind of the strategies when we deal with uh, what the bird friendly design. Okay. So. Uh, we have the second question. Uh, how you manage to have co-living architecture in challenging elevated levels for high-rise concrete glass jungles? Okay, um, actually for the co-living architecture, um, if I interpret it's not wrong, is uh, all the residents here to have some space to share each other. So um, in Hong Kong, um, actually we have that kinds of the clubhouse the uh, share amenity space uh, almost uh, two to three decades ago. So for those uh, shared space, we have the property management 
uh, staff to take care and we have the management fee to take care of those space. So we have the concept for that co-living space. But what I emphasize here is that co-living space, not just within the indoor environment with the air conditioning, but it can be covered outdoor space. It can be have, uh, have that space for planting. So it has the challenge because for those co-living space, um, who are responsible to take care for those plantings there, who are responsible for take care of the security and all the things there. So um, that is the challenge. And, and I, I, I can't give you so definite uh, answer to that point because it all depends on the uh, confidence and the trust among the different neighbors. And what I did before is the garden-based activities can help to enhance the trust among each other because they have the garden-based activities on that space. Like one uh, residential building I did before, we have the, um, uh, several planted plots for the residents to rent the plots for uh, three to six months to plant their own vegetables. Along this process, because they plant their vegetables, they will visit there day by day. Even they have the harvest, they have many vegetables or fruits they can share each other. Or during that planting process, they will talk to the neighbors how to plant it more nicely. Or maybe I'm so busy, can you help to do the watering, so and so. And that can create some kinds of dialogues among the neighbors. And because of that activities, they can gain more mutual understanding and can have more um, interactions and that they can build up the neighborhood and then they can help to organize or to manage the co-living space. So that is not, what I mean is not, it's not just as an architect, a designer, design that space for co-living, but it should involve the proper uh, activities, the management, and also some facility for them to come up with that kinds of social interactions. Okay. So uh, I hope that answers your question, uh, Architect Robinson. Uh, moving on to the next question, uh, again by Sakshi Borse. How can existing building be converted into green building and have green neighborhood? This is a very, very good question. I can say this is the key issue in Hong Kong for the green building. You know, in Hong Kong, uh, we have over 18% of the building stocks are existing building. For the new building, the government can impose some stringent requirements or give them some incentives. So for the new buildings, they can easily to do a green building. But for the existing building, like in Hong Kong, over 16%, but half of that existing buildings, actually at the age of 20 to 30. So there's an old buildings. For the old buildings, there are two big issues for the urban renewal or the re convert it into the green building. One is the, ex the, um, the building structure. Like if you really want to have the, um, the green roof on the roof, but the existing structure in the old days, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, uh, didn't consider the extra loading for that kinds of activities. So for some strategies, we cannot adopt that. And that is the technical part. But the most important part is for the existing building in Hong Kong, we, um, we, are, uh, we encounter the multi-ownership problems. For each building, especially for residential, maybe each unit apartment owned by individuals. So how can we come up with all together to convert it into more like the green or the green neighborhood? So I can't give you the definite answer for that point, but um, that is the key issue, what we are doing in Hong Kong. And what we are doing right now is two, two things. For the technical parts, um, we allow some uh, government uh, incentives like uh, they can build up uh, certain uh, strengthening works uh, with some uh, incentives to do so. Uh, uh, can give them more gross floor area, so and so. And the other part, what we call, we are creating the placemaking. As I mentioned before, we are not just focused on the building to upgrade to be green. We can create that local areas to be uh, more uh, activities among the neighbors and then they concern about their neighborhood and then they can change the, the fabrics there. So um, it's a difficult question and uh, 
I can't really answer you, especially for at the high level of the existing buildings. But some cases I share with you, like under the flyover, some undesignated space, you can have some activities there and then can uh, come up with the neighborhood. Uh, so next, the next question would be, what measures are taken while providing vegetation on each floor since the loads on the building could ex ex exceed? Okay, so I, one point I haven't mentioned to you, uh, like the, uh, the several projects I share with you, the improvised architecture, mobile architecture, and the project under the that improvised urban farm. The key success for those pilot projects are I collaborate with the NGO, the loan organization, loan government organizations, and also the community organizations. Why? Because for those uh, NGOs and community organizations, they have a very strong networks for the neighbors. So they can help to organize the activities. They can help to, and, and also the collaboration with the farmers, the interdisciplinary collaboration. And I introduced a farmer there to uh, touch them uh, the gardening skills. You know, for the urban developers, they are very treasured the chance to plant, and they also want to learn more. So the urban farmers, they or the organic farmers, they can uh, deliver some teaching course there. And the uh, NGOs and community organization, they bring the neighbors there, and that can activate that undesignated space or the scattered space. So the scattered space not is not just what we design as an architect design, again, how we facilitate that kinds of activities there. You, you know, as an architect, um, for the pilot study, I can be the facilitator, but in the long run, I can't. I'm not living in that space. So what we can do is we collaborate with the neighborhood uh, committee organization and also to uh, connect the different disciplines to help them to establish that kinds of activities to revitalize that scar space. I think that software, intangible thing is much more important than the tangible, spin, tangible things. But go back to the architectural student, what I can share with you. Architects right now, in, not, uh, especially in our city, what we are the main role is not just as a designer, but somehow we are a facilitator, we are a collaborator, even we are the creator. Uh, for the projects involving the people or any community project, it has to be multidisciplinary. So we have to collaborate with different parties to bring them together. So uh, this is what I can share. <laughs> and the last question, what measures are taken while providing vegetations on each floor since the loadings on the building would exceed? Okay, that's a very good question. There are, if you are talking about the loading issues, so um, uh, as I mentioned before, if the very old building, I don't know whether you, you heard about the news uh, just two years ago in Hong Kong, in one of the university called City University, there is a big uh, uh, a stadium and the roof suddenly collapsed because of that roof uh, you, uh, have the green roof. And that is a, that is, that is a, then, is very fortunate, no one uh, injury. And that imposed a, uh, a quite serious uh, question about the structural capacity. As I mentioned before, if that is the old building, uh, that has to be checked with the structural engineer. That's the two things we have to consider. When, when, when the old building at the very beginning, they didn't consider extra loading for the extensive uh, green roof. So for the green roof, the soil load is very uh, heavy. Not just the soil load, the soil can absorb the water and the water loading is a tremendous. So uh, the structural engineer has to check uh, not just the loading and also the drainage in case of the heavy rain, whether can drain out. The second thing is for the existing building, the building members may be already aging. So the original load may not be uh, uphold after 20 or 30 years ago. So that have to be considered with the social engineers. But as I mentioned before, you have to identify whether the green roof is serving for what purpose. 
if that green roof is for the extensive green roof, showing for the mitigate the urban heat island effect, or you want to have the visual pleasant, the whole roof to be green, and that you have to check the structural very important. But if you want that green roof for gardening, for planting, you don't need to have so extensive green. You just have the several planted pots for the residents to do the farming there. So in that case, may not may not impose such big loads, loadings on the existing building. So what I really want to emphasize is for the greenery, that should be livable. That should be integrated with the daily life. If you have so extensive, low and go there, that may not really serving the uh, green neighborhood pebbles. That, but that may can serve the mitigating urban heat island effect. Okay, so for the next question about the brown and biodiverse roofing system, that is just follow what I um, described just a moment. Especially for the high rises, if the top roof is not, is not accessible by the neighbors or it's not convenient for the neighbors to access, why you, why you propose a green roof there? But for that roof, if that is adjacent to the ecological corridor or become a part of the green patches along the, uh, bio, uh, the biodiversity infrastructure, that we can allow the brown and biodiverse roof so that roof mainly is you strategically to accommodate some space for birds temporary stay or for other biohabitat, like I mentioned before, the bats or so. So they may not need totally green. They may have some small rocks there for the butterflies. They may need a portion of uh, water there. They may need a suitable uh, native species planting there. So for that, Roofing is not really convenient for accessible, that you can come up with the brand or about diverse roofing. Yes, uh, I think, uh, thank you so much, sir. And uh, I think uh, we have taken uh, quite a few questions today. So uh, we also have with us our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Saili Gankar Ma'am today with us. Uh, welcome, ma'am. And uh, I request uh, our Honorable uh, VC, Dr. Saili Gankar Ma'am, to speak a few words and uh, kindly grace this event. Hi. Uh, hi. You have done a wonderful job. And in fact, it was uh, very informative and thought-provoking uh, session which you have shared with us with a lot of the detailing of it. Right, because how the organizations and especially now the countries have become incorporations, isn't it? And those countries are taking a lot of efforts to make the cities very smart and at the same time uh, taking care of the environment. And that's what precisely uh, the role of architecture design comes in picture. So the detailing what you have shared with us, right, from green environment to skyscrapers and then even the gardening everything you have done it very wonderfully in india i'm sure you must have visited if not we will look forward to host you in india definitely i'm sure dr uma zadho ma'am and simantani they all will take effort to bring you in campus india also has a history to have a different structure altogether and that we always enjoy we always talked about the sustainability we always talked about the green environment comfort and of course the climate which creates an impact on our construction and that is what you have shared it with all of us uh, we look forward to see you uh, the soon in campus i'm sure that you're also safe in hong kong your university your students are safe you all are taking care of it thank you so much for sharing this uh, the your time, your experience, and thoughts with all of us. So thank you so much, and I'm thankful to all my teammates, those who have taken great effort to organize this with our student and the faculty member. And yes, there was a lot of learning. Thank you so very much on behalf of DY Patil University, Pune Ambi uh, School of Architecture. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so Thank much, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I now request uh, Ketki to kindly proceed with the uh, official closure, closure of the event and vote of thanks. So, what are you, Ketki? Yes. Uh, now, I formally start in part of this webinar by giving my vote of thanks. I thank uh, Dr. Diva Patil University for giving me this opportunity to express my gratitude on this webinar. On behalf of our university, I express my heartfelt thanks to our chief uh, guest and speaker, architect Tony IP, for giving uh, your precious time, your pre uh, presentation, and your wonderful insight on green neighborhood in dense cities, not for only humans, but also entire ecosystem. Thank you so much, sir. I would like to thank our Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, Dr. Saili Gankar, ma'am, and our principal, Dr. Uma Zadha, ma'am, for having faith on us and for their constant support to organize this uh, knowledge enriching webinar. I would like to thank all uh, head of institute and head of departments of our campus and also our uh, design chair, Dr. Ravindra Deshmukh sir, our HOD, uh, Professor Umkar sir, and our uh, academic coordinator, Professor Simantini Nakhil ma'am, who have blessed us with their presence. I would like to thank our moderator, ne architect Neha ma'am, uh, for moderating this webinar very delightfully. I would also like to acknowledge our IT department for their technical uh, support in this event. I would also thank uh, uh, architect Gurmit Singh, uh, who is founder of Archie Student, for broadcasting this event uh, on this their page so it can reach maximum people. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all participants for their participation to making this event successfully. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Tony, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank, thank you, Tony, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a nice evening and a weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.